Welcome to the Council of Better Business Bureau's podcast, Better Business, Better Series, where we will explore top of mind topics with business and industry leaders to understand the leading trends and innovations that continue to push the envelope in today's marketplace. For the Better Business, Better Series podcast, I'm Will Johnson. Trust is a word that gets used a lot when it comes to building and growing a business, but the importance of trust cannot be underestimated. Communications and marketing firm Edelman describes trust as whether or not a person or organization is going to do the right thing. For anyone in the business of charities and fundraising, this idea of doing the right thing is essential to success. This week on the podcast, with the help of the BBB's Wise Giving Alliance, we're going to explore the latest findings on donor trust and generosity. Joining us today, Bennett Weiner, COO of the BBB Wise Giving Alliance and Regional Charity Reporting Manager, Elvia Castro. Thanks both of you for being here today. Thank you for having us. Glad to be here. Let me start by talking about the uh, Wise Giving Alliance and this new report we mentioned uh, that really digs into this topic of donor trust. What makes the research a priority for WGA and BBB? Well, we're a standards-based charity evaluation organization, and ultimately we're seeking to verify the trustworthiness of charities by reviewing organizations in relation to a set of 20 accountability standards. So the strengthening of public trust in charities is a very much important part of the work that we do, and we're certainly very mindful of identifying ways in which uh, donor trust can be identified and, and improved. I think, of course, I agree with Bennett. Trust is very much at the core of what we do. What's different about this report is that we're taking a different approach at how we look at trust. So while we, on our everyday life, we focus on very objective ways of helping both the donor to make wiser decisions and then charities to fulfill the standards that make them more accountable and trustworthy. In this particular study, we're looking at how donors perceive trust. So what makes them trust the charity or distrust the charity? And on a broader scale, on an aggregate scale, I would say, how is society feeling about charities? Are they trusting them as a whole? Are they trusting some more than others? And this can raise questions about why that is and um, and what we can do better. All right. So important stuff if you're if you're in this business. And I liked uh, we spoke earlier a line you used. What triggers trust? Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, it has it's a nice verb that sort of helps people I think understand what this is all about. I should mention too, Bennett. You told me that the Wise Giving Alliance has been doing research and working with charities since 1920. Uh, well, under the name BBB Wise Giving Alliance, we've been operating since 2001, but uh, national charity reporting has been an active you know, program in the BBB system since uh, the mid to late 1920s in uh, responding to relief appeals that emerged after World War I. There right. was increased interest, and we've been reporting on charities ever since then. And I imagine trust has been a key element the whole way through, whether you guys were putting out reports on it or not. Tell us about some of the key, or rather... When we look at the business of charities and fundraising, we're talking about a huge swath of business in the country. Let's talk about the scope and size of this business sector. Well, uh, uh, Americans gave about $410 billion to charities in 2017. Wow. And uh, that is uh, a statistic from Giving USA, uh, a report on philanthropy. And uh, 70% of all those monies were from individuals, about 9% from bequests. So almost 80% of giving is from the public, not foundations or corporations, but the public is the mainstay of givers. And that's historically been the case. Uh, the other thing is that there's a huge number of charitable organizations in the United States. Um, there are about 20 different categories of tax exempt status that a not for profit can have. And the IRS 2017 data book shows there are about 1.8 million tax-exempt organizations overall. In the United uh, States. In the U.S. And of of that 1.8 million, approximately 1.3 million of them are charitable organizations, tax-exempt under what is called 501c3, uh, the section of the IRS code that defines charities. So charities make the bulk of tax-exempt organizations that exist in the U.S. It's, It's a huge number. And not only that, the third thing to mention is that um, it is a lar- the not-for-profit sector is a large employer. Uh, a John Hopkins Nonprofit Economic Data Project uh, did a study a few years ago, back in 2015, and there are approximately 11.9 million people that are employed in the not-for-profit sector. So it's the third largest employer that ranks behind the retail trade and manufacturing industries. And uh, people don't recognize that, but a lot of people work for not-for-profit organizations across the country. 
Yeah. What I would say is what all those numbers show at the end of the day is that charities are really important to American life. Um, I think the United States is a very generous country, um, perhaps not as generous as others, but <laughs> but but overall we're, we're very generous. And charities are very important to the way, as a society, we try to tackle some of the most challenging issues of our time, things that have to do with things like health and education. Um, so, so it's important that way. It's also, we know, important in our economy, as Bennett said, about 10% of people are employed by charities. And it's important in the way that people used to spend or choose to spend uh, their money and also their leisure time. We know about 25% of people volunteer their their time to charities every year. Quick personal story. We had a yard sale this past weekend, and I was talking with someone who stopped by saying, there aren't as many yard sales, and we were just discussing the fact that because you can go online and find charities and places to go donate stuff, um, that there just weren't those opportunities or as easily easy to find in past years. All right, enough of that. Tell us about some of the key <laughs> learnings in the report. What, what are some of the learnings in the report? What can charities take from this information to do a better job at gaining the trust of potential donors? So there's the trust word. Yeah. Um, I think one of the most striking um, results that we found is that even though 73% of people say that it's essential to trust a charity for giving, only 19% of people highly trust a charity. Hmm. So there's a big gap there and a big opportunity we see for the sector to help build trust. Um, we think that's important because trust will help you engage donors, um, and it also helps you retain donors. So, um, you know, there's a big opportunity there to strengthen that connection between the donor and, and the charity. The good news about what we found is that we think trust is malleable. Um, we see this because over time, certain types of charities are able to go up the rankings in terms of perceived trust. So, for instance, we know the not-for-profit hospitals were about 11th in, in perceived trust you know, 17 years ago, and now they're number one. So they must be doing something right that we can learn as a sector from. Uh, whether they're doing something ni- right in terms of actually being more accountable or whether they're sending messages to differently and having people perceive them as more accountable. A perception. And, and mm-hmm. maybe I'm jumping ahead here, but are, are, are you able to look at those reasons sometimes, like why a certain charity did jump up? We are, I mean, in the report, we don't go into that because we, we want to... layer of... Exactly. Yeah. It's in a, it's a, there's a layer of interpretation. Um, and of course, we do have our own... Bennett might want to have some sort of comment on that. But uh, we have some interpretations. There are things that we do want to, um, you know, pinpoint as tips or as misconceptions. Uh, but in general, we're trying to, to let, um, you know, others in the sector kind of interpret this. And we've actually engaged some charities in the conversation. So we try to bring people to the office last week from... Um, charities like Goodwill or Kaboom, we have NWCP um, coming in later so that they can give us some thoughts on what they think is happening. And make them top of mind when somebody says, hey, I want to give to an organization. Mm -hmm. Make this conversation uh, more active in the sector. One factor in response to Elvia's comments is that one of the things that the charitable sector faces is what I would call the spillover effect when scams and, and, and scandals occur. Sure. And so when you see a problem highlighted in the major media, about some well-known charity in terms of not being managed well or not spending its fund appropriately, one of the concerns that charities have uh, experienced is people begin to question their other giving choices and other organizations. And so uh, it affects uh, all groups. This is not the same thing in the business sector. When, you know, if a particular business is in a scandal, it doesn't make people distrust all businesses overall. Right. This is happening to the charitable community. And I think the reason for that is that when people are making a giving transaction, it's in one direction. You're making a donation. You're not expecting anything in return. So you're giving on trust that the organization is going to follow through in what it says it's doing. And when that trust is broken, it begins to question the bonds that you may have with other organizations. So that's something that I think that we've seen over the years. That's interesting. Uh, And and another component I, I think we've talked about is the diversity of people who are giving. Exactly. So one uh, another big finding for us um, is to confirm that different people think differently about giving and, and about trusting a charity. So, you know, we ask people different questions like, what makes you trust a charity? Or do you think this is important in your giving process? And older people have different attitudes than younger people. And white people have different attitudes than minority people. Um, and so what we really would encourage the sector to do is to look at those different sectors, uh, groups, I, I guess, um, and and to think about it from different perspective and try to speak to individual preferences. This, this community than, may have a set of beliefs that another 
another sector of, of, of society might not, and to understand them and gain their trust takes some time and research. Right. And for instance, one other thing, and I, I don't have the exact number right now, but over 30% of, of you ask millennials say that they want to be engaged more by charities. Yeah. We're on, only close to 9% of matures say that they want to be engaged more by charities. And what that tells us is a couple of things. Uh, one, go after the millennials. We'll go after the millennials. But on the on the flip side, we've heard from charities that, that they are having a hard time reaching millennials. So what yeah. there might be there is a disconnect in understanding their preferences and how to communicate with them rather than uh, a lack of intent to communicate with that group. GoFundMe is a big deal these days. Do you guys look at that? Is that considered a charity well, in some respects? It's not a charity. Uh, I believe they are a for-profit company. Um, but crowdfunding in general is an interesting topic that we can talk a lot about. We'll have you back uh, for that. But I can say that there are some um, entities like GoFundMe that have been uh, more progressive in trying to put in controls uh, to avoid uh, scam postings uh, from occurring. Right. But this is not to suggest that uh, all crowdfunding can be problem-free. There sure. are uh, some challenges, and I'd be happy to come back another day to talk about those as well. We will schedule a, a, a crowdfunding uh, interview if you can make the time for it. How do small charities compare to large charities? You mentioned Goodwill. That's a big one. Everybody knows Goodwill, but they're s- small and large. How do they compare when it comes to donor trust? Well, when we ask people, 62% of donors say that, say that they trust small charities more than a large charity, and 67% of donors say that they trust a local charity uh, more than they would a national charity. That makes sense. Kind of, you trust your, your local... Well, that, that kind of makes sense, right? But, right. but what we think is that, uh, as we mentioned before, perceive uh, there are different reasons to prefer one charity over another. So you might want to prefer helping your local community, or you might want to prefer helping a very well-established large organization. Sure. Um, but that doesn't mean that you can trust one more than the other. Um, if someone, you know, there can be a scam that appears to be a small charity or a scam that appears to be a large uh, charity. Um, and what we think is that charities of all sizes and scopes can, uh, you know, set up up the, the standards that will make them accountable or, or not. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's talk about common mistakes that donors make or pitfalls to watch out for when it comes to giving. So a little bit of the flip side here, this is not so much for charity organizations, but for people who are giving. Well, there are a number of things that we see that we warn people about to be cautious. And the first thing I'll, I'll, I'll put out is what we call the overhead myth. And this is a tendency of the general public to uh, have an over-reliance on charity finances in making their giving decisions. And in our uh, point of view, finances of a charity are important to identify outliers. Let's say a charity that's spending almost all of its money on fundraising expenses and very little on programs. That clearly is something of concern. But this is not to suggest that you should make a judgment on a charity solely on the charity's finances alone, uh, because that can end up in a false positive. And that's why the 20 standards that we use to evaluate charities cover a variety of issues, such as charity governance, appeal accuracy, donor privacy, uh, transparency in terms of website disclosures, among other matters. So we can give a holistic overview of the charity's operations and management so people can make an informed judgment. But finances alone, we would caution people to just solely focus on that, and that's been one of the problems that we've seen over the years. Mm -hmm. Um, Another big pitfall that we identified uh, through the report is that people tend to overestimate the value of passion and sincerity in the appeal, and they tend to underestimate what it takes to verify whether a charity is... um, accountable and trustworthy or not. So in particular, younger people and minority people say that they can tell whether a charity is trustworthy just by looking at an appeal and see the passion and sincerity that's in it. And we encourage people to go beyond that. Um, of course, by going by to givegod.org to look at our evaluations. But if not that, you can look at other monitor organizations or even look beyond, ask questions from the charities and look at the website, try to get the information that matters to you. I, I can think of various uh, TV commercials over the years that have a lot of passion that that, mm. that uh, I, I wouldn't pass judgment on whether they are or not, but mm. but you, I'm familiar with that type of um, emotional plea that, that could certainly have an impact on somebody who's a donor, and you need to look at it across the board. Maybe with the 20, the 20 points that you look at or simply go to the BBB and Wise Giving Alliance, and you can check folks out, right? That's right. What's the one major takeaway that came away for, for charities in this report, if I can put you on the spot? 
Uh, <laughs> Sorry, ahead. I was. Doing, I, I think the main takeaway we've already discussed a little bit, but I, the main takeaway to me is that there's a big gap there. That people in America really do want to trust charities, particularly now in a time where we don't trust uh, a lot of institutions, even though we know that the charitable sector is falling short on what donors, how donors want to trust. We also know that we're the most trusted sector in the country. So we think there's really an opportunity there to capitalize on that and, and as a sector seek to get more trust from donors and their engagement. Because after all, we're there to solve society's problems. So we can work on this type of thing together. It's really important work. This report has a lot of interesting findings. Uh, thanks to Bennett Weiner and Elvia Castro with the BBB Wise Giving Alliance. Where can people go to learn more? They can go to give.org, which is the website of the BBB Was Giving Alliance. Easy. Give.org. Okay. If you'd like to learn more about the BBB, you can visit us at bbb.org. For the Better Business, Better Series podcast, I'm Will Johnson. You just enjoyed Better Business, Better Series podcast. Be sure to tune in next month for a brand new episode. To learn more about our other shows, visit betterbusiness.blueberry.com. That's betterbusiness.blubrry.com and subscribe. The thoughts and opinions expressed on this podcast are the views and opinions of the guests, not those of the Better Business Bureau, Council of Better Business Bureaus, or program affiliates. This podcast is for information and educational purposes only and is copyrighted with all rights reserved. This podcast is protected by Blueberry's Terms of Service.